to it. Why don't you tell everyone listening a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're from, your current role uh, in life outside of work. Okay. So hello, I am Jaque, pronoun she, her, hers, St. Louis, born and raised mm. and, and, and proud or what is currently known as St. Louis. Um, and let's see. I am a senior diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant currently mm -hmm. in the healthcare space. Have the pleasure of working with you, my friend, mm -hmm. um, and really supporting executive leadership across our organization and integrating belonging, measuring for belonging, um, and thinking more intentionally about how we um, adapt and remain intentional about meeting the needs of a growingly diverse patient community and and workforce um and and how we do that in a way that centers um community and like i said belonging um outside of work uh well always whether i'm at work or not i'm mom <laughs> <laughs> To my amazing kiddo, uh, Eli. Um, I also sing. So hey, music absolutely. is a huge passion of mine. And so if you're ever at a venue and you're like, is that your queen on the background vocals? <laughs> it probably is. Um, and yeah, that is really a lot of what I do because mm. I'm also very passionate about work. Um, and oh, I'll also say that that given kind of the the equity context that I apply in work, it, it also extends to, to my passion outside of work when it comes to community. Um, and so I also serve as a facilitator um, and collective community member of Empower Institute, um, which is a huge passion of mine. And so collaborating with that collective to bring community healing um, and resources is, is also something that keeps me grounded. So that's just a little bit about me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And of course, so humble. Um, you know, if I had to just add a little bit on to that, you know, I would say that, you know, Kui, you really are some I'm lucky, I think, you know, to work with you um definitely as an early careerist, young professional, what have you. Um, knowing that you're still, you know, on your journey, really are, and despite all the things that you've done. Um, and it's beautiful to be able to just kind of be behind you. And, you know, and, and follow your example, because you are an individual that really, you know how to capture people's attention when it comes to the subject matter, you know, um, and then you really know how to take that attention and turn it into actual action in an organization, right? So it's not just having a hour long, you know, Microsoft Teams call, where we're gonna talk to y'all about racism. You know, it really is more about, you know, pulling out of, you know, the individual, using what you know to be kind of common threads through all of us to actually create behavioral change, which in an organization, no matter what the industry we know is a hard thing to do. So it's just been yeah. dope to, to be able to follow your lead. Um, and I know we are here specifically to talk about the Black uh, History Month audit that you developed, which is an amazing tool. But I want to just kind of take a step back and see if you could just go a little bit deeper about DEI um, and how you feel about being a DEI practitioner uh, at this point in time. It's 2024 and it's an election year. This has been a topic that has been both politicized, romanticized um, in the last few years. So I would just love to get your thoughts on just like kind of the state of DEI as you see it. Oh, that is a really, really good question. The state of DEI. Okay. So I feel that first and foremost, it's important for people to recognize that DEI in some shape, form, or fashion has been a part of the rhetoric, the conversation, the agenda. Um, I dare say since the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, right? Because people have been advocating oh, since, yeah. since, you know, the 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 enslavement, the um 
violent genocidal removal of mm -hmm. First Nations, yeah. um, right, since the enslavement of Black bodies as a, a way to jumpstart the American economy, right? Like, yeah. like we could people have also always been fighting mm -hmm. in this space that is now called DEI, wow. right? How do we exist in a space where people are different? Yeah. How do we prioritize the rights of those people um, based on the social identity differences that have been created to really, um, in essence, hold in place um, <laughs> privilege and oppression, right? So um, how do we navigate who has what rights and, mm -hmm. and why and and also who should be included in these conversations, right? So I think that that has always been a part of, of, of our dynamic. Um, I feel that more recently, right, in the era of DEI before where we are today, mm -hmm. DEI was really positioned as like a compliance mechanism, yeah, right? Because once we really started to seriously have this conversation about what America is, right? Um, and, and what our ideals are and how we are and are not living up to them, we also had the very real de facto existence of racism, of, 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 of the oppression of Black folks. Yeah. Um, and people who did not see value in changing that. Mm -hmm. And so you insert laws to say, well, we don't care how you feel, right? This is what everybody must do. We have to be compliant to this in order to be um, in alignment with, with what the, the policies are, right? What's expected. Um, and so DEI, I think, prior to, to where we are today was really to keep people in check, mm. right? To provide oversight, to exist in this space, I'd even liken us to like HR, legal, right? Where who you yeah. come to when you feel like right. you might be in some deep stuff, you may have said the wrong thing, and you mm -hmm. you want to know, are we gonna get sued? Yeah. Are we right? So we were really like it placed in this this lane of policing. Mm. Um, and you know, eventually people are like, okay, we get it. Why are you still here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. But I think what COVID taught us um, mm -hmm. really. Right. Because I think that that is where a really huge shift happened. Right. First of all, this conversation of race and intersectionality started bubbling its way to the national dialogue. Absolutely. Right. And it was really difficult to deny yep. that it exists. Um, and you had a workforce who learned that there were different ways to 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 secure your livelihood, right? You yeah. have folks who are working in corporate spaces that were once like, you gotta come in every day and do your work, who were now like, oh, so I don't have to and the business can still happen. You yeah. have people who realized that they were more dispensable than they thought they were, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like you really, and, and, and when we disaggregated, we saw that that was disproportionately impacting yeah. <laughs> communities right. of color um and folks who are socioeconomically disenfranchised and so mm -hmm. like now we're getting back into this space mm -hmm. um where you know work is becoming more fluid back to work pre-covid as folks say like we're yeah. getting to this more post-covid state where um we're seeing a ramp up in the economy yeah. however people's perception about what they require to work and remain in a workplace isn't what it was it's not just you know do I need to work it's right. like do I need to work in a place that cares about me exactly yeah <laughs> and nobody up until this point has really been like the standard in doing that right i think that that mm -hmm. is kind of how dei is modifying because we're like okay sure like we're not doing things that'll get us sued yeah but also when we look at workplace culture and whether or not we're a place people actually want to come to work mm -hmm. that's another conversation yeah and what we find when we you know take a look at that 
um, is that depending on how we slice up our data, right? Because I think we've always been collecting and gathering data, but depending on how we slice and dice it, depending on how we marry our data to things like retention, um, um, succession planning in organizations that really mirror the growing diversity of our communities, yeah. um, we might find that we're, we're not as successful as we think we are in terms Absolutely. of positioning ourselves to retain amazing talent, right? Yeah. And nurture and grow amazing talent so that our organizations can become and remain sustainable right. and relevant in an ever diversified economy. So um, I think that that is kind of how things have changed. We're no longer the compliance officers. Now we're, we're positioned to help you really think about the culture of your organization within this context mm -hmm. of, of, of a changing and evolving um, world. That's it's amazing. Uh, this, uh, if y'all didn't know, Queen's <laughs> also working on her dissertation, so she's gonna be able to give very powerful academic responses. Just letting y'all know that. But it was, but you, you, you addressed so much, and honestly, you know, my response to what you just said could be a whole another topic, just about organizational culture and how I feel like that has really come back into the forefront of so many workers minds and I feel like just generationally um you know there's some differences but I feel like you know it's like uh the tectonic plates shifting almost because you have people you know that are still you know at, at certain levels kind of like y'all want to do what now like we actually have to care about your humanity who <laughs> like you know we got that going on but then you have a whole workforce of people like no nah, yeah you do like you know i'm not about to just come in and work you know 12 hours and then go home and not be happy or satisfied with my life and so i think it's it's beautiful that you kind of have took us from a period of this is what we were in terms of compliance and lawsuits and still recognizing that that was off the back of a world that had real disparities, real inequities that still exist today, of course, but were being actively, you know, catalyzed back then to now a world where it's like you still have to, you know, account for all of that history, account for all that lived experience. But now it's more about making sure that those folks want to stay and yeah. continue what you need to do. Right. Um, and so I just I love that. And so I think it's beautiful, kind of a, a natural segue into what we're here to talk about today, um, which is the Black History Month audit. This is a, a tool that you've put together that is absolutely um, phenomenal. Uh, it is February 2024, it's Black History. I think this is the probably second or third Black History I've been able to not only celebrate with you, but just work and do something yeah. in work or collaboration within our organization, which is always great. But talk to us about this, talk to us about the, the Black History Month audit, what it is, um, and what inspired you to create this, this tool? Yeah. Um, so I first want to say that the current iteration of the Black History Month audit um, is not the first. I created one a couple of years back, just as I was entering the diversity, equity, and inclusion space as an education cons or ed as a education and development coordinator. So I was really responsible for like curating um, course content and delivering it throughout our organization. Um, and so I, I want to honor that I wasn't in the space that I am now where I really gained like line of sight, um, more organizational exposure. Um, and so that's really what inspired me to come back to the audit and flesh it out a little bit more. So I wanna say that because I honor that some folks saw that original one and that actually that one is actually, I think, still up on LinkedIn. I couldn't figure out mm. it. <laughs> <laughs> and so you might come across that one and then see the new one and be like, this is a different audit. And it, <laughs> and it is. <laughs> um, but in current conversations, you know, I and even back then when I originally created it, you know, Black history comes and we get really excited and it's a conversation about like celebration um, and, and recognizing the amazing accomplishments and contributions um, of Black individuals and communities to, to our overall national fabric. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And um, I feel like oftentimes we get stuck there 
Mm. Um, and I'm as someone who's really, really into history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm oftentimes inspired to think about, okay, this is where we are now, and how has history played a role? Yeah. In where we are now, yeah, right? And sure. so beyond the the, I don't want to minimize its performativeness, mm -hmm. but when it's just the celebration without the honest conversation, mm. um, I do think we risk stepping into that lane of performative um, and not really thinking about how we can impact yeah. um, communities that, and namely, right, um, speaking to this audit, how how Black communities still, to your yeah. point, um, are, are feeling and experiencing um, the impacts of what have been a longstanding history of, 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 of oppression and marginalization. And so this audit, I will also honor, comes from a very um, personal space, right? Right. It's one that I have experienced as a Black woman in several different work settings. Mm -hmm. um, and so every point is one that I've experienced, but it's also something uh, to some, some degree, or at least had some proximity to based on being in community with other Black professionals. Um, and so this audit was my opportunity to say, hey, yes, let's celebrate. And also recognize that that same Black excellence courses mm -hmm. through your organizations. Mm. And I want you to honor how you are showing up for them. Right. Right. Beyond the performative nature of celebrating and telling them that they're doing awesome jobs, which I'm sure you're you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, how are you also um, learning from this history as a way to to create a more equitable and uh, equitable future for your black? And Love it. Love and how it. do we model this? Right. How do we also because one of the things I do point out, right, because it's, it's, it's very clear to me. Some people will be like, well, what about what about this history? What this... about that history, yes. right? And I always <laughs> yes. tell people, I always tell people, first of all, um, I really honor the power of bringing all voices in to share in our collective experiences. And so sure. as a Black queer woman, mm -hmm. um, I do not aim to speak on behalf of all experiences, right? right? I think my role is to make sure that we're pulling those experiences in. But also mm -hmm. I, I, I I honor what Audre Lorde said in that no oppression um, is greater than another and that right. all of it is connected, You're right? Right. And so there is a way to learn from this conversation and think about ways that it can apply um, across these many spheres of exploring equity. Yeah. um across identities so yeah, yeah that was my i appreciate my... your i appreciate you so number one thank you for giving us just the the kind of just the inspiration and the backstory behind where you were when you created the first audit to now and uh you know for those that are listening i'll make sure to like put this in the video but i'll also put some of the pieces of the audit and a link to it of course um on a linkedin post but you know I've loved the fact that, you know, you are unapologetically very specific when you are advocating for certain spaces. I feel like, you know, you spoke to your intersectional identity being a Black queer woman, but I love how you've always been like, hey, if we're focused on this, we're going to be talking about this right here. Like, I'm not like acknowledged, but like, this is what it is. Because when I read the audit the first time a couple of years ago, when you sent it to me, I remember thinking to myself, man. This is the translation in corporate jargon of what I would see on a day to day and be so mad about and how so many people would not understand how in organizations, in corporate spaces, in a job, whatever, jobs are a key to a person's livelihood. Um, and if you still have an org chart that, you know, got the blueprints from when they was building Jim Crow back in the day, it's like, what do you think your jobs are really doing for the people that you're employing, right? And so when I first entered um, the corporate space as my first job out of grad school, it's the first thing that I saw, like, wait, how come all of the environmental service workers and the house 
keepers and everyone in food nutrition is 80% black. And if not that, the other is individuals where English is not a, a, a first language for yeah. them. What's going on? And then I, I go to talk to these, these team members, these employees. Oh, well, I've been a cook for 40 years. Now, if that's what you've wanted to do, I love it. I'm mm -hmm. glad you've been able to serve the organization that way. But if we have had an opportunity to actually get you into a position where we can, you know, make mobility a thing for you, or yeah. even just make sure you're compensated properly for your years of service for doing these things, we could go a lot about changing the community that, you know, you're in, the family that you're in, right? And we yeah. had talked about, you know, long, you know, we had um, long conversations just about imagine all the things companies could be doing that would benefit their business, benefit their operations, and also benefit their people. And yeah. so one of the things that you specifically call out is this concept of representation. And I feel like we're in an interesting time in space because I feel like there are people that are like hashtag representation matters and they get it and they understand it. And at the same time, I would argue that even this conversation that we're having now just about why are all the individuals who work some of the lowest wage jobs in your organization black will be a hard thing for people to really digest and know how to respond. So can you kind of just speak to, you know, intentionally calling out that overrepresentation in certain areas, underrepresentation in other areas. How do we, how do you really suggest an organization or an individual do that? Um, yeah, and we'll just go from there. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I am currently working with um, an organization who has done a really great job of of diversifying up top, right? They're just like, look, we look across our executive leadership, across all the ways that we measure currently for diversity in our organization, we are on target, right? We're great. But when we look through, you know, and that's resulting in, you know, I sit in meetings with them and I'm oftentimes inspired with the way that they're able to kind of integrate their various perspectives into the decision-making, right? It really is, is witnessing in real time the value of having diverse thoughts and experiences in a space together. Now they're thinking, how do we keep this going, right, within our, within our organization? And what they've noticed is that when they look down, they're just like, there isn't this level of representation across our organizations, at least for roles that are actually positioned to maturate into this key decision-making space. Right. And what we're also noticing is that we're making decisions from these diverse perspectives that aren't being appreciated because that level of diversity isn't reflected or cascaded this way in the organization. Right. And so it's difficult to build a culture around that. Um, and so what we're also finding because leadership is not diverse, is that team members who are in these areas that are 80% are, are people of color um, or African-American African -American, um, or, or Hispanic, right? We, or non-English speaking or, or English not being their first language, what we're finding is that they have disproportionately low belonging scores, right? They um, are expressing feelings of maybe not feeling safe to speak up, right? So like we're losing them at a pretty quick rate um, or it's an environment where there's a disconnect between them and their leadership. And so they really aren't being nurtured or grown. And so really supporting leadership, first of all, in cascading this expectation that we care about our employees' growth 
is first and foremost, right? right? I believe that there's a lot of power in, in, in grassroots and, and from bottom up, yes. but also, and mm -hmm. if we really want organizations that are going to shift the tides and change, right? Because eventually people are going to get tired of fighting at the bottom and they're just going to be like, well, I'll leave. I right, don't have this. Yeah. Cause this <laughs> isn't my job. This, I, this should, it shouldn't be like this. Like, let me go. You don't have else. to do this. Right. Yep. We'll just yep. leave. And so yep. what we're seeing is this rapid turnover in that zero, to 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 two year range right people mm -hmm. are coming they're mm -hmm. getting the resources the talent they're learning our processes and then they're leaving yep. because they can't stay because of the culture yeah um and so right and i learned that from looking at the data right from piecing mm -hmm. together what we are already pulling um in terms of metrics mm -hmm. and so how do we um first of all establish a culture and an expectation right um that we're at, that our leaders are talking to our employees right so for me i'm currently working with a team where i'm just like how do our our talent and performance metrics assess how leaders are integrating belonging into their practices how often are they having touch points and conversations with their team members about ways they want to grow but mm -hmm. also how are they they building um this team dynamic how are they right. creating spaces in real time mm -hmm. are they integrating conversations that center team building connection in morning huddles yeah. when they're doing one-on-one -on -one conversations are they assessing for belonging by asking team members hey what does it mean for you to belong on a team and is that what you're experiencing in this space right how, so how do we and how do we get creative about offering opportunities because right we're like well they're doing their role right if they're doing their job then they're doing enough right but also if we see potential for leadership on our teams and are at intentionally assessing for it, how are we also marrying that with opportunities, right? So I'm also talking to a team about like, is there project work that we can create, right? Yes. Like not, not necessarily like that would be burdensome, but that might be interesting to your team members who are showing promise in, in or who might shine as like a connector on a mm -hmm. team. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to support them in bringing belonging activities? Right. Do you have someone who's a natural leader? How right. can we kind of bring them into spaces, give them experience that may not organically be showing up? Right. So it really is in our interactions. And mm -hmm. that's what I think is so powerful about it. Because yes, we can have these lofty goals about we want to diversify our organizations, we want to do X, Y, and Z, but also what are our day-to-day -day interactions saying mm. about how much we care about our employees? Right. Because that's something we can all touch. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think the overrepresentation of people of color in the more service um level spaces, um I think that that's, once again, we look at history and I think that that's pattern. Absolutely. That's pattern. Yeah. Um, and so it really is on us mm -hmm. to think different. And those roles are necessary and they're important. Right. And so even when we talk about like pay equity in those spaces, mm -hmm. even when we talk about um, protection from things like workplace violence in those, in those spaces. Yo, talk about it. Even when it. we yeah. talk about like... Yeah. You know um how we care just as equitably in those spaces as we do in others yeah. um i think that that is i think that that's really really key right mm -hmm. measuring for belonging in those spaces because those spaces are the ones that tend to have lower scores when it comes to like belonging when it Absolutely. comes to ABT, when yeah. it comes to and so um that's where a lot of conversation can start. That's where a lot of mobility doesn't happen. Never happens. Um, even though they offer a wealth of like our, our employee population. So they are our essential workers. They are essential workers in the economy, period. But to healthcare, they are definitely like, you know, some of those essential workers, what we we saw. Um, and it's interesting that you think about well, you, you kind of you you hit on so many different things, honestly, because how to do culture 
is like a book that I've, I don't know if it's, it's, it's out there, but it should be. It, it, it's, it's not a, it's maybe, yeah. I know you're already thinking like <laughs> <these."> book points there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's funny because I feel like, you know, in the examples that I had before, COVID-19, it was really like the leader. If the leader was like that great, like tip top, real coach mentality, like knew how to do that. It was like, okay, bet this is about to be a great experience. And if not, no one really questioned it. Right. And I feel like now we definitely have people that are starting to question, okay, being a man, like there's actual leadership in the people leadership. You yeah. know, there's no more, you know, just everyone assimilating and everyone conforming. And so again, I think that could be a whole another hour long conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like culture. How moving from process leadership to people. Oh, leadership. yo, that's fire. Cause that's really what it's been this entire time. And I, and I want to say with people listening, like, obviously we understand there's a balance. Like, trust me. Like, I think that Jaquie, Jaquie's definitely one of these people who's so sophisticated. Like she will be talking about the work, but in a very innovative and progressive way that like, you don't even know that she's talking yeah. about the work, but that's exactly what she's doing. And so we know like, you know, there needs to be that process, but it, we're just at a point now in society where the people come first, you know, um, we have to be centered in our humanity. And so, um, Queen, this has been, you've, you've talked about a lot. You've actually just answered so many questions without me having to ask them. One of the things that you talked about though, in this latest response was just, you know, you have this bottom up grassroots approach, which is really important for us to capture and amplify the voices of individuals and entry-level positions and organizations. But at the same time, it has to come from the other direction as well. And you really have to equip the leader. Now, I feel like leaders have to want it. They have to be open and receptive and they have to see the world a certain way. Um, and we can all see it in a different way, but there has to be uh, some key foundations that yeah. you need as There's a leader. There's some really... that are non-negotiable. <laughs> yeah, like, who, who has some... <laughs> exactly. What, and, and this is the last question I have for you as we wrap up. What does accountability look like for leaders as it relates to the history month audit diversity equity and inclusion just culture in general what does accountability look like and how do we foster uh that sense of accountability and and actually sustain account accountability for leaders when it comes to this kind of work one of the things that i have come to appreciate is the mm -hmm. power of the metric <laughs> so I ha I'm of two minds here yeah. right I do believe that people have to care right, right. And, and I also think you pointed out something really important earlier about the approach mm -hmm. um I was talking to someone the other day and she was just like you know we tried to have a conversation with our staff and we told them about the 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 racial disparities and you know it brought more questions we felt like they didn't really connect to it that they felt mm. that they were being talked at mm. and that is where i think i've kind of found a good entry point because that mm. is not where we start the conversation yeah right right okay. right to your point we start the conversation with the human connection because I choose to believe that if I were to ask anybody, hey, do you believe that we should live in a world where people should not have right. <laughs> equitable rights and where people shouldn't be able to live their healthiest lives? I don't think anybody would be like, hell, there's not the world I want to live in. Like, what? Right. Quality? What? Like, I don't think anybody at their core wants, I yeah. mean, I won't speak for everybody. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but I choose to believe that most of the people I interact with on a day to day basis and have the opportunity to interact with really do want a world where we're all cared for. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And so how do we start the conversation at the human level? Right. And so that's like, you know, the feely stuff. Right. How do we. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that that's what we need to measure for. How often are we doing it? Um, and how intentionally are we doing it? But. In these areas, because I think it's, but that is not all, because I've seen teams where like, oh, this manager is so nice, but their AVT is super yeah, high. Yeah, that like happens. Really 
friendly person and yep. they um also have really or they might have people beneath them who whose belongings towards aren't great right yeah. and so like how do we start to measure if we say pay equity is a goal mm. how are we measuring for that consistently yes how are we consistently um reevaluating our policies and our practices mm -hmm. and i also think people will be like people will say well this is where the market is mm -hmm. or this and then, is this and that's it then the rest of the country is like this so we don't got to do much guys calm down it's like what <laughs> penny over and then <laughs> and i'm like yeah. Right. So I think that this is where, and earlier I meant to say this, um, I think a great disservice or challenge with DEI really being integral in our processes, right? Because that's the answer, is making, yeah. is making equity and belonging integral to our processes. How do mm -hmm. we apply an equity lens to every conversation that we're having? How are we asking right. who's in the room, who's not, who are the decision makers, who's represented, who will be impacted, mm -hmm. right? Given the, the dollars and the resources that we have, are we um, expending them in a way that will help to address the disparities that we see and right. that we're measuring for? Um, but also, that equity efforts, the DEI efforts have kind of been undermined all along because we haven't paired it with the necessary education to get people to appreciate the why. For sure. You know, I think that that's something that's been hidden behind this veil so that at any moment our efforts could kind of just be snatched away and people yeah. are rooted. Which, um, ooh, it's just, go, this go is, for it. no, we it's go. just, it's so interesting though, because we're not going to, we'll definitely have to have a part two. Um, and probably have a maybe invite a few more voices in to have this conversation about DEI as it relates to all of this, um, because the education is critical, right? And we have individuals who have been proud Americans for 40, 50, 60, 70, in some cases, 80 years in these positions who have a totally different education. So just you saying like it's been kind of underneath a veil it just made me think well, like, yeah, and it speaks to the intentional efforts that we're seeing across many states to remove and reduce that education. And at the same time, one thing that I was thinking when you had said, you know, like DEI has to be integral in everything that we do as a business. For me, I'm like, when I hear that, it's like, when I think of myself as an American, if I'm just using that as the first lens, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because this is the United States of America. We ain't perfect. We are a lot of things that we need to fix internally. Because that's how I think as an American, right? But I know we are not there when it comes. We're still dealing with just so many people who have, they look outside the window. It's a totally different picture. And y'all could be looking at the same exact neighborhood. Yeah. Totally different understanding. So it's like the education it's beautiful when things like, well, it's not beautiful. When 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 periods of civil unrest like 2020 and COVID-19 can all of a sudden, you know, make people kind of wake up or start to say, okay, there's something. Because you talked about it at the beginning of this conversation. It was the intersectional identities that made kind of people say, oh, wait. And for me, it's like, it's so basic, like, duh. But, you know, <laughs> for everyone else, it's like, no, it's not. Like, this is this is new for so many people. And so I just think about the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, it's still going to be a lot of the same things. But with tools like the Black History Month audit, <laughs> um, and with individuals like yourself, I think, in these different spaces and organizations, continuing to get power, yeah, power, influence, capital, um, to make these changes, we can continue to make that incremental change each year, over year, over decade, over decade, um, however long we need to, um, to close these gaps and ultimately reduce any disparity um, yeah. that we see. But friend, I have appreciated you so much. I know you got wow. um, some great things to do. So uh, I think we're, we're done. That probably wraps us up here. I appreciate you as well for coming on and uh, giving some of your time. If you could just drop any, you know, links or mention any social media, you know, accounts you may have, if individuals would like to connect with you, a website, anything like that. 
Yes. Um, so my website is iamjaquie.com. So I A M J A Q U I dot com. Um I think that that's good enough. Those okay. will, those uh will connect you to my LinkedIn and my Instagram. And so yes, Jaquie Rogers on LinkedIn if you're looking there. Um and I am Jaquie underscore between each word um gotcha. on Instagram. Perfect. So, yes. Thank you so much, friend. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right.